Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Pocket for Apocalypse. I'm Gary Machuda. And in this episode, we're going to look at a confrontation between Julius Africanus versus Origin of Alexandria, which was an exchange of letters that occurred very early in the third century. And what is this battle about? Now, many people think that Julius Africanus was advocating a Hebrew canon, the shorter canon. What exactly is going on? What are the perimeters? Are they even talking about the canon? Well, that's exactly what we're going to try to find out here on the Apocrypha Apocalypse. So strap yourselves in, folks, because the apocalypse is about to begin. All right, so it is fight night here on the Apocrypha Apocalypse, at least in terms of ancient Christian church style. And the two battlers are Julius Africanus, uh, early third century Christian traveler and historian, versus Jerome of Alexandria, heavyweight in uh, his influence in the early church. He's a theologian, ascetic, also the father of textual criticism. And what's the debate about? It's about Susanna, which is a deuterocanonical section within the book of Daniel. Now, like I said in the introduction, this exchange of letters is often misunderstood or mischaracterized as pertaining to an argument about the canon. In fact, many non-Catholics will cite Julius Africanus amongst the fathers who rejected the Deutero canon and accepted the Hebrew, that is the Protestant canon. Is that so? Well, that's what we're going to find out. Now, usually they just give names. They don't really explain why. But recently there was a video that uh, was put out by Truth Unites, on which Old Testament canon is right. And it featured an interview with Dr. John Mead. And Dr. Mead actually spells out a little bit about what exactly is going on here. And since I think he articulates it very well, I want to show the clip. And actually, the whole interview is very interesting. We probably will do a response video or maybe a couple of response videos to it, because I do appreciate Dr. Mead's work and I respect him as a scholar. So here's what Dr. Mead has to say about this exchange. And this is where I think the debate comes front and center. There, there were two other criteria. One, was the book in the Hebrew canon? Did the Jews read and accept it in their synagogue? That's criterion number one, major criterion number one. The secondly, and this is where the conflict begins, what was the book uh, read and, and received in Christian churches? <laughs> and um, this, is, this is what leads to, to the debate, I think, are these two criteria that wind up in tension with each other over a select few number of books. So um, this actually precedes the fourth century. You can look at discussion letters that go back and forth between Julius Africanus and Origen of Alexandria in the third century. Africanus, uh, in arguing that the book of Susanna should not be in the canon, Okay, so Julius is sending a, a, a question to Origen saying, look, it doesn't look like Susanna was written in Hebrew. And, and chief among Africanus' arguments is the Jews don't receive it. And we did not receive it from the Jews, the book of Susanna. And he expects Origen to agree with him on this. But Origen writes a really long letter back and he actually thinks, well, no, Susanna could have been written in Hebrew. So he kind of leaves that as an open question. But Origen mainly comes back and says, look, Africanus, we, this, the synagogue is important, but it's not the final factor. The final factor is what books were given to the church by providence. And he makes a, quite a theological argument. And what books are for our edification? And so edification for the church becomes a major criterion that in Origen's mind trumps the, the Jewish canon criterion. Does that make sense? Or the Hebrew criterion. So you get a little conflict between early Christians on this. So first and foremost, I think we need to extend grace to Dr. Mead 
because after all, this is a live video. Uh, he's talking off the top of his head about a very complex subject. And it's really easy to use the wrong words, maybe not use the precision needed for something like that. And he could misspeak. So in no way, shape or form do I want people to think that we're picking on him. I've been on many interviews on this subject and trust me, I made mistakes. I'm sure he probably thought he could put things a little differently. But nevertheless, what he outlines pretty much squares with what you'll find in standard Protestant apologetics. And so I think it, it's fair to critique him and uh, kind of look at whether the text itself bears out his assertions. So let's begin by just addressing a general question. Was the debate about the canon, which books belong in scripture and which ones don't? First off, I think we need to extend to Dr. Mead a lot of grace because he's talking about a complex subject. And when you're talking about a subject such as the Old Testament canon, you really need to use precise language. And this is a, a live interview, and he's just talking off the top of his head so he could have mischaracterized things. Perhaps he used terms that too generally that he should have perhaps been more specific. And so in no way, shape or form do I want to be seen as criticizing him, mainly looking at him because the presentation he gives more or less corresponds to some assertions about these documents that we find in other works. However, I think his characterization is not entirely accurate, and I don't think it's well founded in the text. For example, his use of the word canon that he repeatedly uses in describing this exchange of letters. I believe is out of place. In fact, it's anachronistic. He's taking a term that, as it is used much later in church history, and importing it into an earlier text where I don't think it's warranted in the context. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, as you know, the word canon simply means a rule, okay, or a measure. And you ask yourself, a rule or measure of what? Well, initially, it could be anything and it could be used in any situation. We find it in the New Testament, in the early church, they talk about the rule of all sorts and different things. It wasn't until the time of Athanasius where we have our first undoubted instance of the use of the word canon as applied to the context of those that belong in sacred scripture. Now, this occurs much later than this exchange between Africanus and Origen. And therefore, to import this word canon as having a specific meaning is anachronistically retrojecting an idea into the text where it's simply not founded in the text. Now, why do I say it's not founded in the text? Well, mainly because the word canon, of course, is never used in the text. Julius Africanus and Origen, neither of them use the word canon to mean specifically the contents of scripture. In fact, they never use the word canon in this dialogue. So when he talks about this discussion being about the canon, I find that a suspect. Okay, so that's one red flag that went up for me. The second one, since he styles this discussion as being a discussion about the canon, that is about which books are scripture and which ones aren't, there's a big problem because the question of which books belong in scripture is never breached by Africanus. And Origen only touches on the idea of books later in his response to Africanus. And when he does this, this is by way of a digression in his argument. In fact, it, he's not responding directly to any point Africanus was making. This is something that Origen tacks on. But nevertheless, I, there is no discussion about which books belong in scripture and which books do not. And one of the reasons why I'm asserting this is because of another mischaracterization that uh, Dr. Mead, I'm sure, inadvertently did. He repeatedly states that the discussion concerns the book of Susanna. And here are some instances to refresh your memory. Uh, in arguing that the book of Susanna should not be in the canon. The Jews don't receive it, and we did not receive it from the Jews, the book of Susanna. Now, Africanus never refers to Susanna as a book, never. 
The closest he comes is when he calls it a spurious part of a book, but he never calls it a book. In fact, the discussion is never about the book of Susanna. Whenever he refers to Susanna, he prefers to use the uh, word which we have in English as pericope or a passage. So he's not thinking of Susanna as a book. He's thinking of Susanna as a passage. And as we're going to see in his argumentation, he believes that this was a passage that was added to the book of Daniel at a later date. So the discussion isn't between whether the book of Susanna belongs in scripture or not. That, again, is entirely foreign to this exchange. It's really more about whether or not the passage is spurious, which is a different question. And that's even true when he says something like this. Now, the typical English translation, I think this is from Schaff, gives it as, but all the books of the Old Testament has been translated from Hebrew into Greek. Now, unfortunately, this translation doesn't quite grasp what Afrikanish actually says in Greek. In Greek, he says, all, in as much as regards the Old Testament, was carried out of Hebrew and turned in Greek. Now, notice he didn't say all the books of the Old Testament. He just says, in as much as regards the Old Testament, it was carried from Hebrew to Greek. It's a much looser description. And again, he's not talking about books of the Old Testament, because if he was, then guess what? This would be what we would consider a canonical discussion, but he doesn't use that. Now, we'll learn later in this video how this fits in with Africanus's overall argument and why he doesn't mention books, but uh, we'll see that in a little bit. And I should also note that Origen also never refers to the book of Susanna as well. So if Africanus isn't discussing the canon, then what is he discussing? Well, let's jump into the text. Now, of course, we're not going to be able to go line by line through both texts. That would just simply be way too long and uninteresting, I think, for you guys. But nevertheless, I will hit the high points and we'll trace out some of the arguments and especially Origen's response. All right, so Africanus comes out of his corner and he initiates the first letter. After giving the customary greeting salutation, he jumps right into the issue. In your sacred discussion with Agnomon, you referred to the prophecy of Daniel, which is related of his youth. This at that time, as was Mead, I accepted as genuine. Now, however, I cannot understand how it has escaped you that this Part of the book is spurious. For in sooth, this section, although apart from it is elegantly written, is plainly a more modern forgery. There are many proofs of this. So immediately he states his case that he overheard this discussion with another person. And now he's come convinced that this part of the book, that is Susanna, is spurious. And he, in fact, he calls it a more modern forgery. Now, as we noted before, notice he's not talking about the book of Susanna. He's talking, referring to the Deutero section in Daniel. And he says this part of the book is spurious. So he's not talking about not canonical. He's actually saying that this is a later edition, or as he puts it, plainly a more modern forgery. Then Africanus, he loads up to give as many proofs of why this particular reading in Daniel is spurious. It is not authentic. First, he gives internal evidence why he believes it's a modern forgery. It says Daniel never prophesies by prophetic inspiration. It's always instead through dreams and visions or an angel. Second point is the matter he decides is unbecoming. The Philistian, the playwright, would have resorted to. His third argument and I think this is really the main argument for him, is that the words for holum tree and mastic tree in this portion of Daniel uh, sounds lot like the punishments that are meted out in Greek. So there appears to be a wordplay in Greek where the Hebrew names for the trees, according to Africanus, don't have such a wordplay. And so he sees this as a proof that since there's a word praying in Greek, this 
section of Daniel must have been written in Greek, and therefore it was a later addition to Daniel. And to underscore this, that's when he says, but all the books of the Old Testament have been translated from Hebrew into Greek. Now, we already mentioned this, that in Greek, it doesn't say books of the Old Testament. It's a bit more general. It says, all as much as regards the Old Testament was carried out of Hebrew and were turned in Greek. So it could not be Hebrew. And therefore, Africanus believes, since it must be Greek and it's not Hebrew, it must be a later edition or forgery. Now, we need to make this side note why he thinks it's a modern or more recent uh, addition to Daniel. And that is, you have to remember, this is before Porphyry published his work against the Christians. And in that work, he asserts that Daniel actually wasn't written a while at Babylon, but actually Daniel had a later date. And it's really from Porphyry on that there's this discussion as to the dating of Daniel, whether it's earlier in Babylon or whether it is later during the Greek period. Now, this is before Porphyry publishes his work. So Julius Africanus and Origen both assume that Daniel was written in Babylon. And so that's why this is a very important point for Julius Africanus, because if he says that these portions are in Greek, then that would suggest it's actually a more recent addition, certainly during the Hellenistic period after Alexander the Great. And so that would be a very strong proof that this is spurious. Now, also notice that he doesn't mention the books of the Old Testament. Really what he's referring to is the Greek translation of the Bible from Hebrew into Greek. And he just leaves it at that. So after laying this major argument against the genuineness of Susanna, Africanus then turns to a few minor or lesser uh, criticisms. For example, he asked how Joachim's wife could have been sentenced to death in her captivity. How could the impoverished Jews have a mansion with a garden? He also points out that no prophet repeats the other prophets word for word. And he also notes a difference in style between Susanna and the rest of Daniel. Then he lands the blow where he believes is the most fatal of his objections. And that is that the Jews do not receive this portion of Daniel. And here again, there's that word pericope being used in Greek along with the other two sections at the end of Daniel. In other words, he's not appealing to a Hebrew canon. What he's doing is he's saying, look, this work is spurious. It's a later edition. He says that the Septuagint comes from Hebrew, and there's no wordplay in Hebrew. It's only in Greek, so it has to be a later edition. And then next he points out, well, the Jews themselves don't have this in their Hebrew Daniel. So that's another point that perhaps this is not a genuine passage. So you can see here that there's no reception theory going on where a book is only considered canonical if the Jews receive it. He never says the Jews don't receive it and we don't receive it from the Jews. So therefore, the so-called book of Susanna is spurious. Instead, since he believes the word play proves that this portion of Daniel in Greek is a later edition, the omission of this in the other pericopes at the end of Daniel of the Jews shows that it's a modern Greek forgery. He's not talking about which books belong in Scripture, but he's talking about whether this is a genuine portion within Scripture. So his focus is quite narrow. Indeed, he summarizes his argument as follows. From all this, I infer that this section is a later addition. Okay, so that's the point, that this is a later addition to the text. Then he ends up with a thumb in the eye as his closing remarks to this letter, where he says, I have struck the blow. Do you give me the echo? Answer and instruct me. So you see Africanus is challenging origin at this point in a very cheeky fashion, that I have struck the blow. So I want to hear an answer, and maybe you can instruct me. And indeed, Origen does school Africanus. So Origen of Alexandria comes out of his corner like a seasoned prize fighter. He doesn't start throwing his punches, but rather he sizes up his opponents by 
uh, talking about Julius Africanus's objections. So he begins by reiterating how Julius believes that Susanna is a spurious part of Daniel, that it's a more recent modern forgery. He also talks about his comments about the, the manner in which Daniel pronounces judgment. He talks about the Greek wordplay argument and basically he talks about the text not being found in Hebrew. And it's during this recounting of all the objections that Origen sees a major opening in the defenses of Julius Africanus. Why? Because Julius Africanus insisted that the scriptures are translations out of Hebrew into Greek. And this simply is not true. And this is where Origen begins to exploit this inaccurate statement. He says, quote, in answer to this, I have to tell you what behooves us to do in the cases, not only of the history of Susanna, which is found in every church of Christ in that Greek copy, which the Greeks use, but is not in Hebrew or of the two passages you mentioned at the end of the book containing the history of Bell and the dragon, which likewise is not in Hebrew copy of Daniel. Now notice here, Origen makes his first appeal to Susanna being present in all the churches of Christ. And he'll keep hammering this point home about the ubiquity of this text that's being read as scripture in the Christian church. He goes over this over and over again. Notice also that he talks about the Hebrew text. He doesn't say the Jewish scriptures. He's not talking about the Hebrew canon or reception in the synagogue. He just simply wants to point out that the Greek Septuagint uh, is not completely translated from the Hebrew. Now, like I said, he is really going to exploit this opening by Julius Africanus by showing that that statement is a gross exaggeration. And not only with Susanna, which is that prime target for Julius Africanus, but Julius, if he used that method, that if it isn't found in Hebrew, it must be spurious, guess what? You just undermined the whole of the Christian scriptures. And so he's going to exploit that by pointing out how through his own study that there are literally thousands of passages in the protocanonical books that do not square with the Hebrew. He says, thousands of other passages also found in many places when with my little strength, I collated the Hebrew copies with ours. And then he goes on to say how not only in Daniel, but also Esther, Jeremiah, Job, Genesis, Exodus, all these books, all of them either have more material than's found in Hebrew or Hebrew has more material that's found in the Greek. So it doesn't square that whatever's in the Hebrew text should be in the Greek text and vice versa. And he says, basically, look, if that's true, then you prove too much. You undermine the integrity of the Christian scriptures. And this opens the floor for uh, him to make a very important point where he says, quote, and forsooth, when we notice such things, are we forthwith to reject as spurious the copies in use in our churches and enjoy the brotherhood to put away the sacred books current among them and to coax the Jews and persuade them to give us copies which shall be untampered with and free from forgery? Are we to suppose that providence which in the sacred scriptures has ministered to the edification of all the churches of Christ. Notice again here, he talks again about all the churches to the ubiquity. Had no thought for those who were bought with a price, from whom Christ died, whom, although his son, God, who is love, spared not, but gave him up for us all, that with him he might freely give us all things. In other words, God would not have abandoned his people whom he redeemed, by allowing them to receive sacred scripture, which really wasn't sacred scripture. For the Christian, therefore, it's inconceivable that such a thing could occur. Yet Africanus's method, when it's applied to all the sacred books, would suggest just that. 
Now note again, like I said, Origen asserts that these books are found in all the churches of Christ. And by the way, Origen is in the position to make such statements like that because he traveled throughout the Christian world. And he was very interested in examining text wherever he found them. So for him to say that this particular portion of Daniel is read as scripture in all the churches of Christ, as he actually has the experience to verify something like that. Now, in regards to edification being the main criteria, like Dr. Mead mentions, I'm not so sure that's really what's at work here. In fact, it seems quite incidental. He's also talking about the sacred books that are read in churches as a whole. And so I don't think he's making a distinction either within scripture or saying that these books are somehow not scripture. They're just for edification. Now, Origen says, quote, in all these cases, consider whether it would not be well to remember the words, thou shall not remove the ancient landmarks which thy fathers have set. So he's quoting Proverbs. What's important about this is notice that he's talking about the reception of the scriptures, the holy books, the sacred books in all the churches of Christ. And he likens Africanus's understanding of rejecting Susanna Aspurius as being akin to removing the ancient landmarks which thy fathers have set. In other words, according to Origen, he understands that this particular collection of books that are found throughout the Christian churches are landmarks, ancient landmarks that are immovable. They can't be changed. And also notice that they are established by the fathers. So this is an ancient tradition that goes earlier than Origen, that these books, as they have them, were to be read by the church and also backs up his comments about God's providence looking over and guiding the church. He then continues to explain why he does the work he does. And this is also a very important component of his argument. He says, quote, this, if it be not arrogant to say, I have already to a great extent done to the best of my ability, laboring hard to get at the meaning of all the additions in various readings. While I pay particular attention to the interpretation of the 70, lest I might be found to accredit any forgery to the churches which are under heaven. So let's break this down a little bit. First, he says that he checks all the additions. Now, by this, he's not only talking about the Hebrew Masoretic text. He's also talking about the Aquila, which is a very literal Greek translation of the Hebrew text. Also, the Theodosian as well, and probably others. So he's not merely comparing Hebrew to Greek, but he looks at all the additions. Why? So that he won't accredit a forgery or something spurious in the 70. So in other words, his study of these various texts helps him to weed out, let's say, copyist errors and things like that, other distortions that might be found in the Septuagint. So he doesn't think that the Septuagint is utterly pristine Rather, you need to compare all these different texts to make sure they're good. Now, continuing on, also notice that he speaks about all the churches under heaven. Again, he keeps talking about the same kind of collection that's found in all the churches around the world. Obviously, this would precede the time of origin. Continuing on, he also makes a very important admission. He says, quote, and I make it my endeavor not to be ignorant of their various readings, lest in my controversies with the Jews, I should quote to them what is not found in their copies, and they make use of some of what is found there, even though it should not be in our scriptures. For if we are so prepared for them in our discussions, they will not, as is their manner, scornfully laugh at the Gentile believers for their ignorance of the true reading as they have found them. Now, this is very important because Origen says, this is the reason really why I do textual criticism. First, I want to make sure that comparing all the different readings, that there aren't any forgeries in the Septuagint. But second, and perhaps more important, is dialogue with the Jews in order to have fruitful dialogue, we need to be on the same page. 
pretty much literally. So that's why Origen looks at the Hebrew text, because he wants to know that when he's dialoguing with Jews, that he's not going to give a text that they don't accept. And also he wants to be aware of any texts that they might give that are not found in the Christian scriptures. Okay, so he's not saying Hebrew truth here. Rather, he's saying that they believe that their scriptures are true, and so they'll mock those who uh, produce texts that don't accord with their belief. Now, this might sound very familiar to you about the idea of knowing which books or which passages are accepted by the Jews for Christian Jewish dialogue. Uh, earlier last week, we released a video concerning Melito of Sardis, in which we showed evidence that that is precisely why Melito of Sardis constructed his list, was because he wrote a book called Extracts, which had proof text from the Old Testament that establishes Christian doctrine. And of course, in order to do this and know which books to draw, Melito of Sardis basically does something very close to what Origen does. He wanted to find out which books he can use. Now, Origen takes this one step further, though, because he's not only concerned about books, but he's concerned about the texts themselves and passages within the books. And he says, so far as the history of Susanna not being found in Hebrew. Now he turns his attention to some of the criticisms that Julius Africanus had regarding the text, beginning with that wordplay in Greek between the two trees and the two punishments. And Origen basically is kind of ambivalent about that. First, Julius Africanus actually seems as if he's saying he knows which trees are being referred to, and there isn't this kind of um, uh, wordplay going on. And basically, Origen checks into the matter. He finds that Jews don't have a clue what the Hebrew name of various trees would be. And so he kind of wonders, well, Julius, where in the world did you find out this information? Then he does something very interesting. He reveals that in his discussion with Jews, that the Jews actually retained traditions concerning this episode that's recorded in Susanna. For example, they're able to produce the names of the elders, and they also have some other information about this. Speaking about Jewish traditions that continue concerning this passage, he says, quote, but probably to this you will say, why then is the history not in their den if, as you say, their wise men hand down by tradition such stories? The answer is that they hid them from knowledge of the people as many of the passages which contain any scandal against the elders, rulers, and judges as they could, some of which have been preserved in uncanonical writings, apocrypha. Now here again, our translation fails us because the Greek doesn't say uncanonical. The Greek just simply says apocrypha. So they didn't preserve it in their apocrypha. And this is, this is contrasted to their public books. So you have apocrypha, which means hidden, and you have their public books or manifest books. So Origen raises the point, and he's actually going to double down, that the Jews had removed portions of scripture perhaps even books. Uh, therefore, if you think about that, Origen couldn't possibly have affirmed any kind of Jewish reception as a criterion. And in fact, in my books, I argue that the early Christians were aware that the Jews had altered the sacred collection of books, getting perhaps as early as just a martyr. But they were unsure exactly which were removed and which were retained. And this unawareness uh, led to lots of problems to try to figure out what the Jews officially accept. Origen takes this one step further and claims that portions of the text were also altered. He says, we need not wonder then that if this history of the evil device of the licentious elders against Susanna is true, but was concealed and removed from the scriptures by men themselves not far removed from the council of these elders. Now here again, I think Dr. Mead uh, kind of gives a mischaracterization when he says that Origen would say, uh, reception in the synagogue, well, okay, but that doesn't really square 
with what Origen's saying here. He's accusing the Jews of removing sections of the books from Scripture. So therefore, this criteria of acceptance within the synagogue wouldn't fly with Origen. Now, again, I don't think Dr. Mead was deliberately trying to be deceptive or to give a wrong impression. He's in an interview, he's talking off the top of his head, and we should extend grace in that regard. But quite frankly, as we read on, you'll see that Origen was not okay with the Hebrew reception idea. And quite frankly, I don't even think Julius Africanus was arguing for Jewish reception per much. It was really tied to his argument about the Greek wordplay. But anyway, let's continue. What I have said is, I think, sufficient to prove that it would be nothing wonderful if this history were true and the licentious and cruel attacks was actually made on Susanna by those who were at that time elders and written down by the wisdom of the spirit, but removed by these rulers of Sodom as the spirit would call them. So after going through various things in the New Testament that aren't found in the public books of the Jews, Origen concludes that obviously is nothing wonderful if the history of Susanna was expunged by the Jews. Again, that's very problematic for a Jewish reception idea. Obviously, Origen didn't believe that. However, also notice this, that he says that this portion in Daniel was written down by the wisdom of the Spirit, which sounds like a claim of inspiration. Now, what's interesting here is the words in Greek he doesn't say the wisdom of the Spirit in Greek. What he says is the providence of the Spirit I wrote down this story. The same word that's used earlier when he talks about how God's providence could not have failed to ensure that the scriptures that are read in all the churches for the edification of the faithful was preserved. So you have God's providence here as the author of the writings, and you have God's providence in terms of the church receiving and retaining these writings. Now that Origen has landed some pretty big blows to Julius Africanus's case, now he continues with a flurry of punches, so to speak, about all the minor arguments that were brought up, beginning with the assertion that Daniel doesn't normally give prophetic utterances. It's usually through dreams or through angels or something like that. Well, Origen responds that we need not wonder then that Daniel sometimes prophesied by inspiration as when he rebuked the elders sometimes, as you say, by dreams and visions, and other times by an angel appearing to him. And he gives some New Testament text and other texts to suggest that the prophets had this capability and that he would use it. Now, in regards to Julius Africanus mocking, so to speak, Susanna as not even being worthy of the Philistian playwright, Origen takes him to task and basically says, how dare you talk about scripture in this way? He says, for if we are at liberty to speak in this scoffing way of the scriptures in use in the churches, we should rather compare this story to two harlots to the play of Philistian than that of the chaste Susanna. Now, again, he's talking about church use, used in all the churches. Again, reoccurring theme over and over. This is really his major criterion. Origen continues, And since you have asserted, as if you knew for certain, that Daniel in this manner judged by inspiration, which may or may not have been the case, I would have you notice that there seemed to me to be some analogy to the story of Daniel to the judgment of Solomon, concerning whom the scripture testifies that the people saw the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. This might also be said of Daniel, for it is because wisdom was with him to do judgment that the elders were judged in the manner described. Now, this is really interesting because now Origen is making an analog between the protocanonical book of 1 Kings, where Solomon is judging between the two women who's the true mother of a baby, with that of Deutero Daniel. And he doesn't seem to make any distinction in terms of the authority of the two. Now, at this point, I think that Origen thinks he has Julius Africanus against a rope. Julius is wavering. He's knocked the stuffing out of his argumentation. And now Origen really goes on the offensive 
And I think you see this also to use that analogy with boxing is sometimes when the opponent's on the rope and that's when they start doing these little feints, trying to get them to bite so that when they throw their punch, they'll be open for the final counter blow. And I think this is really where we are in the dialogue. So now he's going to bring up something that Julius Africanus never brought up. He's going to say, oh, yeah, well, you said this. Well, guess what? That means this, and it's even worse for you. Okay. Now, what do I mean by that? Here's the passage. He says, quote, where you get your lost and one at play and thrown out unburied in the streets, I do not know, unless it is from Tobias. And Tobias, as also Judith, we ought to notice, the Jews don't have. So he picks out a phrase out of Julius Africanus's letter. It has nothing to do with any arguments. This is just a little phrase he throws out. And Origen says, oh, oh, this phrase, I don't know where you got it from. Sounds like it came from Tobit or Judith. Oh, wait, the Jews don't accept Tobit and Judith, right? Oh, we got whole books that aren't found in the Jewish scriptures. So here he's going on a digression, but it's a very interesting digression. So let's continue reading. So he says, uh, we ought to notice that the Jews don't use them, and they are not even found in the Hebrew Apocrypha, as I learned from the Jews themselves. So, oh, you use this phrase? Well, guess what? This comes from Tobin and Judith. Guess what? The Jews don't accept these books. They don't even include it among their Apocrypha. However, he continues, since the churches use Tobias, since they're part of our scripture, you must know that even in captivity, some of the captives were rich and well-to-do kind of saying, oh, yeah, you know, after knocking all your arguments, I just noticed this little phrase. And guess what? This goes on to tell you another big problem that you haven't even thought about. Like whole books are not accepted by the Jews. And he says, well, since they're in our scripture, Julius Africanus, you must know that, guess what? People did well in the captivity, which was one of his minor arguments. Now, Origen then considers what's said in Tobit, and he thinks, yeah, that's not super solid. So now he appeals to Nehemiah, and he says, again, we read in Esdras that Nehemiah was a cupbearer and a eunuch of the king of the Hebrew race, made, made a request about rebuilding the temple and obtained it so that it was granted to him with many more to return and build the temple again. So to prove his case, I mean, look at Nehemiah. Nehemiah seemed to have done pretty well in captivity. So even if Tobit's texts are a little weak and maybe you can wake a lot of them, Nehemiah certainly puts to rest your objection. Then he goes on to talk about prophets don't quote each other word for word. He gives several proto-canonical examples of where that happens, and it happens quite a bit. And as far as the difference of style between Susanna and the rest of Daniel, Origen kind of brushes that aside. He says, I just don't see it. And then he concludes, this then is my defense, especially after all these accusations. Speak in praise of this history of Susanna, dwelling on it word for word and expounding the exquisite nature of the thoughts. Such an enconium, perhaps some of the learned and able students of divine things may at some other time compose. And that's also very interesting, too. Very tantalizing that this section in Daniel, Deutero Daniel, would be the subject of study and praise of those who study divine things. And he concludes, after basically knocking out Julius Africanus, he concludes, this, however, is my answer to your strokes, as you call them. Would that I could instruct you. So a nice tie-up to the bout between Julius Africanus and Origen. Uh, I hope you found this helpful, and God willing, we'll be able to do some more. So thank you so much for watching.